Hello, I'm Sylvia Leonard Wolf, a member of the Woodstock Birdcliff Guild Board of Directors and of the Birdcliff Forum Committee. I'm also on the Exhibitions Committee. It is my deep pleasure to welcome you to this episode of Woodstock Masters, the one celebrating the life and work of Donald Elder. These sessions are recorded and will be available to share with others on YouTube within a few days. Donald Elder will be interviewed for this session by Douglas Shear, who is the lead of the Birdcliff Forum Committee and a member of the Woodstock Birdcliff Guild Exhibition and Programming Committees. Doug is also a painter and a writer who lives in Woodstock. He co-founded Artist Talk on Art an incredible collection of interviews with over 8,000 artists. Doug headed the Artists Talk on Art, a New York City panel discussion series, which he ran from 1974 through 2019. That collection is now in the Archives of American Art at the Smithsonian Institution. It is the largest audiovisual collection ever taken in by that institution. Doug also serves on the Education and Public Engagement Committee of the Samuel Dorsky Museum of Art at SUNY in New Paltz. Thank you, Doug, for doing this program. Thank you, Sylvia. Uh, Donald Elder studied at the Art Students League, the New York Academy of Art, and at Pratt Institute, and also abroad in Italy. He was awarded a Pollock Krasner Foundation grant and worked in Paris on an extended uh, Edward G. McDowell grant. His work has been exhibited in New York, Luxembourg, and Switzerland, and as part of public and private collections through the, throughout the US and Europe. After moving from New York to Woodstock in the late 1990s, his emphasis became abstract landscape, but he continued to paint pure abstracts. Whether abstract or abstract landscape, his work is tactile and absorbing. Both styles offer unconventional gesture and sophisticated tensions between hard-edged and romantic. Elder is profoundly influenced by nature even his entirely abstract works take their visual cues from actual forms in nature with phenomenon, texture, color, and juxtapositions becoming abstracted and impressionistic through shifts in perspective. He has now made Woodstock home for decades, drawing inspiration from majestic mountains and wild forests of the Hudson Valley and the gardens he created around his home and studio. He has been represented for nearly 30 years by the Elena Zhang Gallery in Shady, New York. Donald. Yes, good morning. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to screen some images now of Donald's art, uh, and he will uh, provide most of the commentary. Well, like you said, nature pretty much uh, explains my work, my gardens, uh, the woods around me. And this particular piece uh, is, a, is a triptych. I think it's like, uh, what is it? It's uh, 25 by, I can't see, I forget the size. Anyway, and it's based on my garden and reflections in water from little ponds or pools around my garden. Um, it's oil. Um, it's mostly worked with a palette knife uh, with some brush strokes. Um, and it uh, studies well in color. I enjoy working with color. Uh, it's primarily not much more I can say about this unless you have a question about it. Um, but, uh, we'll, we'll go to the next one. This again is a, is a waterscape. Um, I started doing waterscapes probably, I don't know, off and on 10 years ago. Uh, I find them very abstract. 
that's uh, the reflections from above or, or, the, or the foliage or plants around them reflecting in the water become very abstract. Um, this one is just a great contrast, I think, in, in, in color, you know, the, the, the rich blues against the, the soft and warm pinks and the darks, the light greens, but it um, kind of speaks for itself. It definitely is a water, uh, a water image. And, and as abstract as I can be, and without being too literal, uh, I think that's... This is another waterscape. This one, um, I think it's, it was 48 by 54 inches. And it took a long time to, 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 to do. It was uh, lots and lots of layers of paint that were glazed, one glaze, one glaze after another after another. And it's a very dark painting, but it's, it's full of light at the same time, I think. Um, I have some uh, little touches of, of color here and there against the dark, along with the, uh, the bright lights that sparkle. It's more or less something that could be seen or as an, an evening painting, a night painting. Uh, but it was a painting that took a long time to do, mainly because there are so many glazes, dark glazes looking over and over and over until I, I reached the uh, color saturation that I wanted. This is, um, so. and let me add too, that all of my paintings are pretty much from my imagination. I, I don't literally paint, you know, plain air or, or from images themselves. I take my uh, images from, basically from my imagination. And uh, I'll start with some color, pick some colors, and, start laying them down here and there, and before I know it, one color leads to another and tells me what to do. So this is another example of that. This could be construed as a, a water painting or a garden painting, you know, however the person doing it sees it themselves, because it's, I, could, I could tell people what it is and they would see it differently anyway, but it's, a, it's basically something from my garden. So many of these works are um, remind me of Monet. Uh, yes, they do. Certainly, certainly very impressionistic, but some work, some of your works also look rather classical. You know, before, well, well before impressionism. Is is that part? Of, you consider that part of your, uh, we'll, well call it mental reference. Well, the painting you just showed. I mean. Definitely was uh, could be a water painting of the ones you have shown before. A water right. painting. And I think I've had many people say to me, "Oh, you're painting a lot. You know, your paintings are very much like Monet paintings in a way." That's a great compliment. But I wish my paintings were as good as Monet's. But the point is, I think if anyone does a water painting uh, that has uh, heavy paint. Uh, it's going to be compared to Monet in some form or another, mainly because it is a water painting. Um, but um, I, I've certainly been influenced by Monet, as I've been influenced by many other artists. So I can't say that you know that it isn't a Monet painting <laughs> that I right. not intentionally tried to do, but uh, it just comes out that way. I respect his work so much, and, uh, and I'm sure I've been influenced by it. I, I, have, I remember going to his gardens and his studios uh, years ago and sitting in the garden and sitting in his studio, and, and I was able to see what he was seeing too. So, I mean, um, I'm sure there's influence. And this piece is... Um, it's like, I, I like white paintings as well. I, I do a lot of paintings that are basically white, off whites, with a tiny bit of some color coming through here and there. And this painting is uh, misrepresented. The title here that whoever did it uh, on the head of it says waterscape, but it's really not a waterscape. It's, mm -hmm. it's more, has more of a feeling of a, of a winter kind of feel to it. And if you look closely at the, at the lines here and there, uh, that they could give you the, impression that they're trees um, but and it's very thickly done it's very thickly painted and uh, you can see there's a soft undertone of a sort of a 
pinkish purple there that's very, very muted against the uh, several different shades of white. Uh, but it's uh, one of my favorite paintings uh, from a while ago. And this, this again, uh, I, I, I like plants. I think I like plants more than I like people sometimes. And I, I've always enjoyed plants and gardens and flowers and trees. And uh, this is probably something from my garden that I just put together uh, a, a spot, a place, uh, and uh, which, uh, you know, any day of the week, I could just pick up my palette knife or my brush and start something that's outside my window that I've seen or remember and, and do a rendition of it. But this is a, I could say a garden painting. And this again, uh, this piece here is uh, also garden related. Um, I may have put given you too many paintings that were garden related. I'm not sure what I did here. Um, but uh, these are exaggerated color, which, which I like. Uh, some, some complementary colors. Uh, it's just, it's, it's another form of landscape to me. You know, it's a close up of a garden, you know, part of a landscape. Uh, so, And if you want to go to the whatever is after this, I'm not sure. Uh -huh. This piece is a, it's a large piece. Well, I mean, it's, uh, I think it's 48 by 60 inches. And uh, you can see at the bottom, you know, the, the movement of the brush strokes here that, you know, relate to water, movement in water. And then the, the above part, the blues and the, Turquoise colors, uh, uh, I think I use too, because it really pops the reds that I placed on top of it. And uh, I just feel, feel comfortable looking at this painting. I, I, I like this painting a lot. Um, it was painted about uh, maybe two years ago, or maybe a little less. Um, but um, I find it has a lot of energy and a lot of stillness at the same time. And, uh, I like this painting. You know, I can't help when I saw this first a uh, few weeks ago, I immediately thought of Joan Mitchell. Yes. Uh, who, of course, spent many, many decades in France. She did. And she actually lived just down the road from where Monet's exactly, house exactly. was. Per. So this is certain, you know, this is sort of like channeling both Mo Monet and Joan Mitchell. Well, and it's, it's, it's interesting. In that sense, I think it's very successful. Well, the lines at the bottom could be, is very much like a Joan Mitchell kind of brush stroke right. in a way. Right. And a combination of the solid areas uh, uh, put it together can become Monet and Joan Mitchell, however you want to look at it. Right. But, uh, if you look at the, the much older paintings, uh, the last paintings of Monet, uh, some of them, uh, Joan Mitchell's paintings of, of this era, are so much related to Monet's paintings. They're right. very abstract Monet's paintings at the end of his life. And you will see the same kind of brush strokes very freely flowing in his paintings. Mm -hmm. And when I was looking through many of Joan's works, um, it, I put, I, I saw immediately, you know, something that perhaps she had found influence in, but, um, not to say that she was certainly copying him. She had. She was one of the most incredible painters ever. I, I, I really do uh, appreciate and love her work. But uh, well, she I had think there's a relation to all artists. You take yeah. something from here, you take something from there, right. and you try desperately to make it your own. And uh, but you can look at almost any artist whose work you see, and I, th I think you can find a relationship there to someone else's or someone else's. But, uh, but, um, it's a compliment when anyone says to me, your work has any element of a Joan Mitchell or, 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 or a Monet. So um, hopefully 
Well, I, I meant it totally as a compliment. And, uh, oh, no, oh, no, I accept it as a compliment. Thank you. Yeah. I think the other thing that was going on with, in Joan's work, in, in addition to being so Monet-like, was the unfinished areas that was Cezanne's, uh, you know. Yes, yes. Most engaging thing for me right. about Cezanne's work, and particularly the watercolors, was the the areas left untouched and, and uh, what that did to the composition. Yeah, a lot of Joan's work is done on uh, these big open white backgrounds too, which right. Uh, right. And, uh, encases her, 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 her beautiful line, uh, her beautiful solid colors uh, of forms. Yeah, that's, uh, sometimes she'll have a, a single canvas or even a diptych that on a, an enormous scale, yes. where there's actually more white area then there is color uh, applied to the canvas. It presents her work beautifully, that white background. It presents these great forms that she's a, she was able to create and, uh, and the wonderful line that she had. Uh, you know, she knew exactly what she was doing. And, yeah. and she did it well. This piece, this is a, a favorite painting of mine that it's never been shown other than in some photographs here and there. It's, I've never shown this painting. It's been a part of my studio now. Uh, going back, I would say almost 20 years. And uh, it was probably when I first moved up here too. Uh, and this is, of course is water related and, and uh, nature related, and, but it's very expressive. And it's been one of my favorite paintings. It's a triptych. What is, what's the scale of this piece? This painting is about 12 and a half feet long. Uh -huh. but it's about just, I think around seven feet high by 12 and a half feet long. Mm -hmm. And it's a triptych, it's three panels uh, that, um, and one of the reasons probably too, I haven't shown it in where it's, it's rather big. And, um, so, this, so this piece is, rather than being particularly impressionistic, this is much more expressionist. Expressionist, well. yeah. I didn't really start doing a lot of the impressionist uh, feeling work of mine until I moved here and started painting nature. And, uh, and I've always loved abstract expressionists. I've always loved, uh, you know, uh, abstract impressionist. And uh, this is a combination of that too, but it's, 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 it's more abstract, I think. But it still relates to, you know, a, a visible image that, that people will connect with, I think, as, as a, a form of landscape with water. Um, but it's just a, just a favorite painting of mine. Mm -hmm. Occasionally, I'll put it up on a, on a big wall in the studio and just live with it for a week or two until mm -hmm. I need that wall to, to paint on to, to, to create something new. Mm -hmm. It's uh, been with me for a long time now. Uh, probably uh, that's the complete shot of the painting. Right. Uh, and this painting is also, it's, it's acrylic and oil. It's, a, oh, it's mixed yes. media. Uh, some sections are acrylic and uh, then there's lots and lots of oil painted over different parts of it. So, uh, but, uh, this piece is, uh, this is a work on paper. It's oil on paper. And unfortunately, my shot, you can see the, 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 on the left, that corner is a little off. It wasn't, I didn't focus it correctly, but I couldn't tell because it was so white to begin with. But I can tell now, but it doesn't really take away from the piece. And, and this is oil, is that correct? Or this is oil, oil on paper. And it's, uh, this is sort of mixed media, I guess you'd say. It's, it's mostly all oil, but I have some graphite in it as well. Uh -huh. um, I have a lot of graphite lines. I like to, um, to work with graphite sometimes in wet oil paint. Uh, the graphite mixing with the oil basically becomes a pigment itself. Uh, but uh, what's, in, what's engaging what's engaging here is a combination of the opacity and the transparency mm -hmm. yeah. and the things bleeding through and so forth. Yeah. Well, it gives you also the depth. There's a lot of depth in this. A lot, there's a lot of dimension, I think. I mean, I, not always the best judge of my work, but um, there's a softness to it too, and a lightness to it that brings out, that's closer, you can see some of the lines, I, I think now being close up. 
Um, but it's, uh, and there were, actually, these, were these lines uh, part of your, your foundational work and then you laid color over or did you no, also- no. Well, you also put some of the lines on later? There was no foundation drawing of all. I don't work with, I don't draw uh, before I paint. Uh, I may draw on top of the paint. Uh -huh. And then at another period, the next day, as the paint has become a little tacky and a little drier, mm -hmm. when you add some more paint of it, it kind of fills in those lines. Right. And, uh, and uh, it gives you a, a sharper line, maybe perhaps with a different color, depending uh, uh, if you're, placing another color right over that line that had been sort of in, in so sight. So you don't, you don't tend to make marks on the canvas before you begin painting? I make marks, but I make them with paint. I okay. don't do them with, is, I don't do it like a, a traditional drawing of the image. I no, was, charcoal or, or anything like that. Like, I'm so, say that again, please. Well, like with charcoal, with a charcoal stick. Or, no, no, I don't. Or ink. I just start, I just start out, when I approach a painting, um, I usually pick one or two colors and um, I will just start laying out forms or, or, or marks on my painting and kind of start to balance them around and uh, the colors. And actually I find that um, one mark leads to another, to another, one color to another. Uh, it's, 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 almost, it's almost channeled in a way. I, I don't know how to explain it, but and I rely on my eye a lot. Uh, you know, when something is, looks right, to me anyway, and when it doesn't. And uh, mm -hmm. I play with the painting until it starts to come together. And once it starts coming together, then you start tweaking it in a way that you know that it's, it's working. Uh, at least it will work that moment. I can leave that painting overnight in the studio uh, thinking I love it and come back the next morning and, and, and not liking it at all again. Right. And start painting again and it again. Provokes, it provokes me to ask you, how do you know when it's time to stop? It's, it's like everybody says, it's, it's one of the hardest things to know sometimes. There are those, those wonderful moments when you have a painting that really worked, it almost worked instantly and you know it. And, and those, are, those are blessings, I think, because that's what you strive for. Um, I think I've been in a down place since being sequestered from the virus at this point. So painting hasn't been easy, but I'm still waiting for that day when I get this really great painting, which will then lead me to the next and then to the next and the next. Um, uh, but um, this painting um, was done um, a year and a half ago to two years. Um, and it's all a study in blue, as you can see. And it took me a long time to paint this piece because um, there's so many blues going on and I had to wait for some to dry and I would add white again and I'd wait for the white to dry and I'd do a glaze and a glaze and another glaze. And this painting is all about glazes over, blue glazes over one another or another. And uh, it's um, again, one of my favorite paintings too. And it's done with a palette knife. It's mm -hmm. most all of my work is done with palette knife or painting. So it's, it's hard to perceive the depth here, but I'm presuming that like many of your paintings, there's actually a sort of impasto that's built up here. There is, yes, there is. Uh -huh. Actually, it doesn't have as much impasto that many of my paintings do have, but uh, because there are a lot of glazes. Once I got to a place with this painting, I laid out certain blues to brighten them. I added whites, whites had to dry and then another glaze went over that, and then another, maybe another layer of white somewhere else for another blue. So it did build up. And uh, lots of my paintings are very thickly painted. I, I like, uh, I, I, and I think when you're working with a knife, it's automatically gonna be thick paint. I mean, you, there are areas depending on how, what pressure you put on, on, on the tool itself that will give you any degree of thickness, but, uh, um, I just love working with the palette knife. I've been doing it for many, many years. And then I'll come back like this piece. This is very thick paint. Um, the blue lines that you see, um, those were done with a brush over top of everything else there that was done with a palette knife, just built up and built up. And uh, the blues were added, added as an after 
uh, thought. Um, and what what is what's the dimension here? Or the, are the dimensions? this is um, forty eight by sixty okay. inches. This piece works better in person than it does in the. I think. But I think I think that's the whole nature of impasto. Uh, I remember visiting Milton Resnick's studio. He had a he, he and Pat Pazlov had his and hers synagogues in the Lower East Side. Uh, as their studios, and right. his work, his work, and he always had a few pieces up on the wall, studio wall. They were so thick with paint that you couldn't appreciate them unless you were, you're practically nosing right against the canvas. Yeah, well, and everything was, everything was so mottled and and uh, had and pitted and uh, and the details were amazing. But you'd have to go right in. You could, you exactly. couldn't appreciate the paintings except in person. I think you have one coming up, maybe that's that thick. Some of, my, some of them are well over an inch thick. And the weight, this piece here, uh -huh. this piece is, a, is also a triptych. And it's also it, well, it's a 60 by 150 inches long. It's a uh -huh. rather large piece. But this, paint, this painting took forever uh, to create. And this comes from my travels, basically, I, I have dear friends in, in Greece on the island of Crete, and I visit them occasionally. And we were walking way in the mountains, and these beautiful colors were far in the distance. And when I walked up, there were just a field, a gigantic field of anemones in balloon, the purples, the reds, the whites. And I had never seen anything like it before. And months later, after I was home, I kept that image in my head. And this is a, an image that I try to recreate, uh, you know, which the paint is literally a half inch in most places on this painting. And it, I just worked it forever. And this is the final, final product. But this also is a painting that needs to be seen in person to be fully appreciated. Right. Uh, it's unfortunately a little soft in this, in this image. I'm uh, sorry, sorry, what? It's a, it's a little soft in this image, not quite sharp. Yeah, but it's, uh, it's very heavy too. That's better, like that we can yes. really get a better feel for it, yeah. And this is a, one of my favorite paintings as well. Uh-huh. Uh, this is um, a diptych, 48 by 72 inches. Mm -hmm. And I've always loved uh, Asian, Asian art, the whole Asian aesthetic. Um, I love Asian gardens. Um, I love anything that's Asian related. And I find that this painting uh, kind of relates to that in a way. It has the feeling certainly of, of something Asian. Um, it's um, the line uh, is, um, it looks like writing. Uh, it might say something I don't know, but uh, it, it also too is, is my thought behind it is like water. It's like uh, forms, you know, just graphic forms almost on top of a space that can be water uh, with a bit of color here and there that could use, you could use your imagination to, um, to, to think of it as a reflection from above, from somewhere else or from something actually in the water. But uh, that's uh, what this painting is basically about. And this one, more abstract, I do a lot of paintings like this too. A lot of people think of me as basically a landscape painter, which I am, and I'm, I love being a landscape painter, but I didn't really start painting landscapes until I came to, to the uh, Hudson Valley years ago. I started doing a little, few little paintings and I got, I enjoyed it so much that I kept doing it. and. Uh, and they started to sell, so I did more and more. And uh, which, uh, but this also is very landscape to me. And uh, it's just forms that you find in nature put together abstractly. Uh, and um, this is the other side of my landscape painting that uh, purely abstract. And this is what I love to do as well.
This is another, you know, it's very abstract, but it, again, I think it relates to nature. Uh, Water lilies. It could be, <laughs> yes. Uh, are just forms uh, from light that, that hit the water in a certain way. Uh, and, and it's however someone perceives it or sees it, whatever their eye uh, comes to see. And uh, you can ask five people what they see and they'll all have a different uh, idea. Uh, like you, I do see water and that's, I guess it just pops into all of my paintings one way or the other. This is a, this is a triptych. Um, and again, uh, it's, it's about forms, forms and, 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 and brushstrokes that just kind of uh, complement one another, I think. Um, and sometimes I can do a painting ab so abstractly, but somehow, some way they seem to come back to water. I don't know what it is. But, uh, and this is a, uh, it's filled with color as well. I mean, I, I think bright, beautiful colors. I like this piece as well. It's okay. And, this piece is a, it's a favorite old piece of mine too. This goes back to 2012. And uh, I remember working on this piece uh, with just, I kept the palette very, very, very simple and uh, very dark, but it's filled with light too, I think. Um, it's uh, obviously, again, a water painting. And uh, it's one of my favorite old paintings. This is, uh, was painted at the same time as the, the painting previous to the one before, I believe. Uh, again, it has a very strong uh, Asian uh, feel to it. Uh, also a diptych. And, uh, and uh, again, it's just basically form and line put together uh, with color. Uh, lots of color here, I think. Um, and uh, some of the lines actually do look like writing. Uh, and Asian, Japanese, Chinese, whatever way you're thinking, but of course, uh, it's just a beautiful, I think, uh, brush stroke. This piece, again, is a uh, landscape, very abstract. Uh, I love dark forms as well. I did a lot of paintings once of stones, just very abstract stones, and, uh, and uh, that were floating on water, floating in space. And uh, this is probably one of those ideas that popped up when I was painting this painting. Uh, this is about 36 by 36 inches. Um, and it's, um, I think, I can't see, there you go. That's more of the painting. Um, but um, you can see nature in this, I think. If you, if you want to study it and look at it. Um. So uh, to start off asking you a few questions, um, uh, how would you describe your, your creative process? Uh, since you don't tend to make sketches first, um, are you mainly starting out from a color perspective, uh, you know, based on a a kind of palette, you know, a preference of palette. Um, in other words, you arrive at the canvas with green in mind or red in mind or whatever it might be that rather than specific uh, ideograms or, you know, or uh, sketches. Um, so since you don't make marks, how do you start? And then how do you progress? Well, when I approach a canvas, I generally don't have an idea at all. Uh -huh. Like I said, I would generally pick two or three colors 
And sometimes I will blindly pick a color. I mean, it's like a, it's nothing is signed in stone as to what colors I'll use. But I'll generally start with three colors. And it's not that I don't make marks, but I do make marks. I make them with, with a brush or, or with a palette knife. So I'll start with marks here and there on the canvas. And those marks will lead to other marks and to other marks. And finally, I'll see the painting come together in some form or another. Mm -hmm. And then I will start adding to it. I may try and change another color, add another color. Um, but um, like I'm not painting from uh, you know, anything specific. I'm just painting from my, from my imagination. Uh, creating, I might think, well, I'm gonna do this and it's gonna be landscape related in a form of the other or, uh, or a garden thing, but it's like, I'll pick the colors and just start laying them out. And the painting kind of tells me what to do. Once you start painting, the painting kind of dictates you what you have to do in order to make it successful. Uh, I mean, once I think at a certain part of, in, at a certain time in your life, if you've been painting long enough, your eye starts to tell you what to do. And, uh, and um, I also, I've been painting so long now that it's almost automatic, you know, mixing a color, mixing a color. I don't have to think about, you know, how to mix something. It just comes automatically. I'll pick this and I know what's going to happen. Um, but that's how I approach a painting, uh, totally blindly, pretty much. So where I would take you next is uh, because the surface of your paintings is so important and it's hard to see in these images, you know, because it, it's by the nature of this, it's rather, rather flat. Um, I'm wondering how you feel when you're building up the surface. Uh, it's got to be a very sensuous sort of experience. Uh, and so how are you engaging with the canvas? with the image uh, emotionally? Um, well, emotionally, when I feel it's working, I'm very happy. <laughs> when it's not working so well, it's, I can be very depressing in a way. But uh, how do I engage with the painting? Uh, I engage by just doing. And the more it comes together, the more pleasing it is. Um, but um, I don't know, it, it's, it's like, a, what was the other second part of your question? It's, well, you know, that, that uh, uh, because so much of it is so physical, other than the physical act of gesture, so much of it is, is the physical surface uh, in your work, particularly when someone sees it in a gallery situation or in the studio, as opposed to how flat it, it can look. And this is true for a lot of artists, but because your work is so multi-dimensional, inch by inch, there's so much detail, particularly in, in the canvases that are more, much more heavily laden with paint. Um, it, there must be something going on in the creation that um, that is uh, that comes about because of of how thick the paint is being applied? Well, I mean, anytime you put paint down in a particular place or particular, I guess you'd say, thickness, uh, it's, it's going to um, make you have to do something else. Paint kind of directs you. Uh, if that's, it's rather hard to explain, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but once brush stroke one palette knife fill of paint leads to the next to the next. So it's, it's like, I'm not really thinking about it. I'm just automatically doing it. Okay. And, uh, and uh, at some point it starts to, to come together. And, uh, right. and so uh, setting aside the current year that we've all experienced, which, which has meant so much isolation, um, there's a lot of conviviality in Woodstock among artists. And uh, I'm wondering if you, in your pastimes, have invited in others, you know, have uh, gotten feedback from people during the process of your painting and whether that's had any impact on, um, or whether you prefer to work in more in isolation uh, and not have people 
uh, sort of looking over your shoulder and handicapping paintings in process. Which is it for you? Well, I do work pretty much in isolation, um, but I do have friends and artist friends and, and people who, who appreciate my art come sometimes and I might happen to have a painting or two. I generally work on five to six paintings. I have them around the studio. I don't work on one, same one every day or I can change over and over depending what, what's happening with one painting. But people will come and they will give me their opinions sometimes. Um, um, usually, uh, I don't really take their opinions because I know if I start doing something that I feel that they, they see, um, it's not going to be that anyway. It's, it's, it's coming from me one way or the other. The final product is going to be mine. Uh, Lots of times people will come and they see it and they enjoy it. That gives me great pleasure to know that they, they appreciate it and they like it. Um, but um, as far as giving me advice, no one really does that. Um, so, but um, so, and this is the feedback. And some of them are quite good, you know. Oh, I like this because, because, because. But mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, usually after the fact of what I've already done. So, mm -hmm. but, so most of the artists in this series, you know, which we're calling Woodstock Masters, uh, are at a, a fairly mature or advanced stage of their careers. Yes. Uh, and age, generally. Um, and wh what I'd be curious about is, what do you view as sort of the next phase? I mean, clearly we will, we will emerge from the pandemic era sometime this year life will go back to something looking like normal. Um, from a, a creative point of view, from an artistic point of view, where do you see yourself going in the immediate future? Oh, it's a good question. I ponder that question at night sometimes when I'm laying in bed awake thinking of what next? Uh, what will I be doing? What can I do? Um, what direction I want to take? Uh, and uh, I think that's yet to be seen. Um, I don't know. I think I have to start focusing a lot more on my work each day, um, particularly because of this, this year and the last years of politics and things. Your mind has been kind of uh, screwed up a bit as far as what's going on in the world, but it does impact your daily, your daily life and your work. Um, and, um, I think I'll be, I think I'll be fine though. I am painting more now and uh, finding some new directions perhaps, um, but uh, uh, we'll see. I think time will tell. Let's ask me that question, you know, in six months or a year from now and see what I've done. And then uh, maybe I will. <laughs> you're more than invited, more than welcome. Yes. But uh, I don't know, I have ideas, but it's like having an idea for a painting and coming in and doing it and starting it. But as you start to execute this painting, it's, it changes from, from one, one moment to the next. So your original idea can end up being nothing like what you thought you were going to do. So I, I don't uh, trust uh, ideas so much because paintings change. You change, your hand changes, your, right. your eyes change. Uh, right. But it will... They take on a life of their own. They take on a life of their own. They talk to you. That's mm -hmm. like when I said to you, when I lay out something here or something here, a color or a form or a shape, it sort of speaks to me and tells me that you need to do this here or you need to do something here. It's basically a balancing of, of form and color. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, and that's what leads to, I think, a, a successful painting, uh, mm -hmm. one way or the other. Well, I think, I think the work that you've shown us today um, is consistently successful. Thank and um, I very much have enjoyed being able to dwell on those with you. And I appreciate, uh, I appreciate uh, your willingness to do this with us. And thank you very much. I was happy to do it. I was a little apprehensive in the beginning, but now I'm happy I did it. Right. Um, it's a friendly, we're, I think we're very friendly. <laughs> you seem to be. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, anyway. Right. Sylvia. Um, 
I'd like to thank you, Donald, for sharing your, your insights with us, your process, your thoughts, your feelings, the background of the pictures. It was just a total pleasure to be able to be immersed in these pictures, up close, alone, nobody else looking, just having this private viewing of luscious, luscious paintings. Thank you, Sylvia. As you were showing them, I think, oh, I'd love that one. Okay, no, I'd love well, that one. Some of them are available. Most of them are not. But they're <laughs> well, there are about eight that I would love. So, thank you. I'm sure there are one or two there still that you could. This was really a pleasure. This was just an thank immense, you. sensual, intellectual, full body pleasure. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. Thank you, Sylvia. And thank you, Doug. And thank you, Judy. And so. thank you, Donald. Thank you, Doug, for this very insightful, well prepared interview. Thank you, Judy, for your part in filming and producing it. Thank you to Carlin Benson the director of exhibitions at the Woodstock Birdcliff Guild for your part in presenting this. Um, thank you to the forum committee, Doug, myself, Judith, Jackie Callahan, Holly, George Warren. Um, I know I've forgotten somebody, but- Rachel Jackson. And Rachel Jackson, very important too. Um, thank you all. Thank you for being part of this Woodstock Birdcliff Guild forum. Um, anybody who'd be interested in donating to the programs to enable us to keep doing this, that'd be very, very welcome. Go to the website, watch the YouTube, share it with your friends. It's just our pleasure to be able to bring to you backgrounds and interviews and in-depth understanding of the artists that make the incredibly wonderful, unique, village of Woodstock be what it is. So thank you all so very much.